Aaron, take it away and introduce your folks. All right, can, yep, I'm on. Okay, oh, so I'm Aaron Boyd. I spoke a little bit earlier about storage. I'm gonna be your moderator. If you are just joining us, I work for Red Hat in the office of the CTO, primarily working on hybrid cloud and multi-cluster capabilities for storage. But enough about me, I'm not the, the smarties on this panel. Um, so if you guys wanna go ahead and introduce yourselves and maybe tell us your most controversial opinion of the future of AI, just to really start it off with a bang. Daniel, you wanna start? Uh, Daniel Reek, uh, Red Hat, Office of the CTO. Um, I manage the AI Center of Excellence. Um, the most uh, controversial opinion is like, I think we're better off with AI, and, and I, I'm a big fan of Max Tegmark, who, if I paraphrase him, basically says that it's okay if AI replaces us because it's just the next round of, of evolution of life. So, uh, I think that's okay in the long term. <laughs> okay, Alex, go ahead. Uh, hi, good, um, good afternoon. So I'm uh, Alex Housley, uh, founder and CEO of Selden. Uh, we're an open source uh, machine learning deployment platform uh, providing model serving, model management, and, and governance. Uh, so yeah, good question. Um, so uh, I, my most, most controversial view is really that this uh, kind of AGI thing that people are talking about is probably unlikely to happen. Okay. Are you all familiar with what that is? Do you want Alex to explain more AGI? Yes. Artificial general intelligence. Okay. So, uh, you know, in a lot of these discussions, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the topic quite quickly goes on to this kind of uh, singularity and, you know, the world of a super intelligence. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, that is quite, you know, way off, if not un unlikely to happen at all. Um, and there's many more uh, exciting things that, that uh, you know, changing the world, uh, revolutionizing all industries, transforming our lives with the technology that we currently have available today. So I think it's really good to, to focus on that. Okay, yeah. great. And Fred? So uh, I'm uh, Frederick. I'm um, head of edge infrastructure over at uh, Doc AI, which does medical AI. Um, I also have uh, worked in the uh, open source community extensively in uh, networking, and one of the things that I focus on is uh, bringing uh, things like AI into uh, into the infrastructure. Uh, my most controversial opinion, I think, well, uh, among many, is I don't think that we're doing enough socially to try to work out what to do when AI starts to replace jobs, and we need to start focusing on that now and not wait. Great. Those are all really great points. Thank you, guys. So I'm glad you guys touched on how AI is going to improve our lives. It's not necessarily this you know, doom, except for maybe some jobs. Um, but for the most part, AI seems to always be seen as a bit of a savior in enhancing our lives and a new technology that's going to revolutionize. But we're also seeing how that technology can exploit people and their data and their privacy. So since this panel is about AI and ethics, um, tell me why we need uh, ethics in AI. Frederick, if you want to start. Sure. So um, I, I think you framed it very well. So like, AI is going to be everywhere. And it's something that is absolutely going to improve many aspects of our life. Um, but like any particular tool, the uh, AI is particularly interesting in that as we start to build more AI models, the type of things that we decide to build, uh, or <coughs> excuse me, the uh, the type of things that we uh, that we decide to train it on, the the types of uh, biases that exist in the in the data centers are amplified. It's 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 not just like hey, I have this tool, I'm going to use a tool I used it once. It's like I built this tool, and this tool is fully automated, and it learns, and it's going to do this thing over and over and over again. So we need to make sure that the type of things that we build. Uh, that when when we build something that's going that it's going to reflect on our on our ethics systems on how we on how we approach things, and so we need to make sure that we that we form these type of thoughts that we have these type of discussions uh, that are absolutely important to have, so that we can all be aware of them. And e even if you don't have all the answers or we don't have all the answers today, just the fact that we're a little bit more aware of them means that we can drive in the in the right direction and, and come up with a more fair and, uh, and uh, beneficial outcome. Okay, so Alex, can you address with the discussion of ethics how we can practically 
enforce that or lead the community in that way? Can yeah. you talk more about so, that? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's so much about enforcement, uh, but more about like how can you um, put in place uh, processes, tools, etc., cetera, to uh, enable an, an organization to uh, actually deploy machine learning models in a fair and ethical way. Uh, you know, data science in itself was, and still is in many cases, a big challenge for organizations. Uh, so, you know, everything, everything from obviously gathering the data, training, building models, and then, you know, operationalizing the models. I think about 60% 60, 60 or so of organizations now are doing some kind of machine learning, but only about 13% of those are uh, in, in production. Uh, so, you know, that's great for the kind of challenge between data science and DevOps and how the two kind of teams uh, kind of uh, collaborate uh, through deployment. Uh, but the things which really matter, uh, you know, to an organization as a whole and to, you know, execs and, and, and sort of, you know, people at board levels, et cetera, um, are around, you know, will my organization get fined by regulators? Will we get reputational damage? You know, will we kill people by accident? You know, that, those kind of things are, you know, incredibly damaging to a business. And so, you know, these are um, uh, things which uh, ultimately uh, will be uh, driven by ethical principles, which are kind of commonly accepted, uh, but not formalized. And then regulations only starting to emerge. And as they emerge, obviously, they're a, a moving target. Uh, and, uh, you know, both broadly across industries and sort of, industry specific and uh, uh, what uh, companies ha have to do is, is the big challenge here of uh, uh, translating these rules written in English or other languages into code which they can drop into their machine learning pipelines to avoid them from blocking up. Um, so you know, that's a very big problem and, and one which is really best, so be best solved through open source collabor collaboration, you know, a lot of the, the best um, tools that, that we've seen emerge for things like explainable AI, bias detection, et cetera, right. uh, have emerged in, in open source. So, um, and that's obviously built upon open research. Right, and so with those rules, um, you know, that will train these models, there also is um, liability around those. Um, Daniel, can you go into how liability today with our models is maybe going to become more important in the future? Right, yeah. So. Uh, in the way AI is used today, it's basically uh, in, in use case where you have limited liability or you are scapegoating someone else with a liability. I, and so it's like, uh, you know, if I, if I drive a, a self-driving car, of a famous car maker from California, um, I, you know, it, it drives itself on the highway about in Massachusetts. Well, I'm not going to say how fast it's going. That probably would be admitting to a... Uh, <laughs> Misdemeanor, but uh, and and like I'm I'm of course not necessarily paying the same attention. And, and then Jeffrey's talked about the, this morning, even like a cruise control, uh, you're not paying as much attention. Now the, that car is actually driving itself on the highway, taking exits and things like that. Um, the way and and if if that car killed someone, it's a big scandal, right? That that happened, right. and it's it's a whole different story. Like humans. Like self-driving cars have a much better track record than humans, as in like they kill less people per million miles driven. But it's still like if it happens once, it's a or twice, it's a it's a big big scandal. Um, and the way they're working around that is basically they're telling you as a driver you're still responsible, right? Mm -hmm. Even though everyone knows that you are not living up to those responsibilities. The whole point of having that car is so you don't. <laughs> so that that like th th that works for now, but that doesn't work in the long term, right? We need and and you know if you if you look at like more serious applications of AI, the lack of explainability, the lack of uh, um, controls around, is the biggest inhibitor to the actual use of AI in many very beneficial areas, right? We are basically confining it to this kind of scapegoat areas, or you can, or, or confine it to giving advice, but we're not living up to the uh, potential for automation because it would be too dangerous, or it would be too risky from a liability point of view. Right, and so when we talk about, um, as far as liability, and that kind of also enters into the realm of privacy, um, when we create a new model and we're training that model, we're using personal data 
most of the time to be able to train that. Um, so what is being done within the community to help protect users' data or uh, randomize the data as, as it learns so that we're protecting user data and lowering the liability to those models that are being created? You want to start off with that, Frederick? Sure. So there's a couple things that you can start off with. So uh, very common techniques uh, are pe people are starting with things like uh, anonymized data sets. Uh, I think we need to be a bit careful with those, though, because even if you have a, a data set that's uh, anonymized uh, in isolation, the moment you start to pair it up with Twitter data, Facebook data, then you can often de-anonymize uh, many of these data sets. Uh, and so in terms of trying to protect user information, so this is something that I think we should uh, have a lot of training and focus on, is like how, is how do we develop and use techniques that are designed to still learn the signal of a population uh, or it's the signal of, of your data set, but not learn any individual part of that data set. So there's techniques that are, that are emerging. So we have things like federated, uh, federated learning, which you leave the data where it's at uh, remotely, you send the model over to it, you train on it, you send the results back so you never have to centralize the data. Um, you also have other techniques like differential privacy where you add in noise in certain parts of the of while you're training the model. And what this noise does is it adds in plausible deniability into the model itself in such a way that it makes it very difficult to extract information out of it uh, on any given user. But the noise is centered around uh, is centered around zero, so you still preserve the uh, the signal, and so they actually use this technique uh, very often uh, for uh, for sensitive questions when they do statistics. So they might ask a person like, "Hey, have you tried cocaine in the past year?" And if you just ask that question flat out, people will say no for a variety of reasons. And if, if but if you put the person into a let's say a uh, into a a box that's isolated, and you put a coin in there, and you say, okay, well, flip the coin. If the coin comes up heads, answer the question. If the coin, uh, and you flip the coin again just to, to erase your initial coin toss. If, if it was tails on the first time, you flip the coin, and then if it comes up heads, you write yes. If it's tail, it comes out no. When someone says, oh, you answered yes to this, you said, yeah, I answered the, uh, the coin toss question. And so it gives them plausible deniability. And it turns out those same techniques work in the, uh, while you're training uh, data, uh, while you're training models. So we can, we can apply these type of techniques in such a way to help preserve them. So even if you have no intention of even sharing the model, but perhaps the model is, uh, is, uh, is stolen by some group of, uh, of, uh, of attackers or so on, and ends up on the dark web, like you still have some protection for those users that you train the model on. So I think it's very important, like these type of techniques uh, become um, not only well known, but become mature and, uh, and standardized through the industry. And they, re they do require more data to train on, but uh, as we start to develop as an industry, we're going to get better at developing on larger quantities of data and also uh, develop techniques that still allow us to, to train on smaller sets of data but still maintain these, these types of privacy techniques. So uh, I heavily implore people to look into these type of techniques and if you're a researcher to also in, uh, invest in researching in some of these techniques. So, you know, after you've developed the model and you've, you've done what you can to anonymize the data or add noise so it makes it, um, you know, fair, quote unquote, um, you also have to be able to say, how do we get that result? You know, where is the explainability around it? Alex, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so, you know, one of the big challenges around machine learning is uh, effectively you're pushing, you know, large data sets through complex algorithms and producing a model which has you know, millions of, 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 uh, of, of uh, features and, uh, uh, and, and rules, effectively, which are not interpretable by, by people. So, uh, you know, people often obviously refer to them as like a black box, and uh, there's uh, a, a, a trade-off, really, between kind of the performance or accuracy of the model uh, and the interpretability. So, you know, if we take the sort of self-driving car example, the car will crash less, uh, with a you know, uh, neural network deep learning model, which is uh, you know totally uninterpretable on a on the most um, sort of you know precise basis, and so the challenge there is really you know how do we uh, still produce uh, an explanation that uh, you know is interpretable by humans, but you know doesn't uh, um, you know, require you to use a sort of substandard model, 
Uh, so you know, the variety of uh, sort of techniques emerging, uh, most through open research and, and open source projects. Uh, a lot of you would have heard about things like Lime and Shap from you know the, a few years ago. Uh, we're seeing uh, actually from the same uh, uh, authors of, of Lime a very promising uh, feature attribution uh, algorithm called Anchors, uh, which will uh, allow you to uh, uh, isolate the specific features uh, which enabled you to um, deliver a certain output and, uh, and then uh, provide a score weighting on those. Uh, so you know, you're then able to present back to uh, whether it's a data scientist looking to kind of uh, debug the model effectively or to someone who's sitting on a customer service desk and needs to you know, speak to a customer. Uh, then um, you know these are these are uh, it, it's possible to explain it in the context of which features uh, had had that impact on the output, and it can be very you know easily vi visualized. Um, another technique which we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, is, is, is very helpful and interpretable is around uh, it's called counterfactual instances, and uh, you know this will tell you uh, uh, what you'd need to change on the input feature to get another output. So for example, um, if you have been declined a loan, uh, it would tell you what you'd need to change on the loan application for the application to be approved. You might say, get a higher salary or whatever. And so you know, <laughs> that's uh, uh, a, a different type of question to right. ask the explainer. So that's kind of where we see explanations is not just you know, a one-stop or one type of question, there's lots of different questions. Um, and uh, uh, it's only just starting to become uh, kind of accept accepted and understood. Um, but from the work that we've been doing at Selden, uh, you know, we believe that a lot of the techniques which are now available um, really uh, should, you know, are, are at a, the standard right now that they should be adopted by regulators uh, officially and, uh, you know, Financial services and other, you know, industry, regulated industries uh, should be able to use these techniques, you know, in FX trading or you know other other environments which are currently, um, you know, kind of like a no-go area for for some of these models. Right. Okay. And so, with you know, this morning Dan Jeffries was talking about um, making that fair. So you're talking about regulation. The idea of having that would be to provide a fairness, explainability, transparency um, to that. Um, but um, maybe, Daniel, you could talk about what place does open source play in terms of making that fair? Well, so there, there are a bunch of reasons why you want this in open source, right? Like, anyway, ultimately, if if you can't inspect the the code that's supposed to guarantee the fairness right on and, and like in in many ways I, you know some of these techniques will actually use machine learning themselves to you know watch the machine learning and things. you get like pretty <laughs> complex things um where you know you, you have two inputs you have code and you have uh, you have training data and uh, you know i think you need sufficient transparency on both of that to actually be able to trust us. Sure, you can always put like measurements around it, but that only, like, you can only measure what you, it, it gets very, very complex, right? And it gets right. very hard to trust it. Um, I, th I think it's, it's really, really, uh, you know, we've proven through like, the evolution of open source and and you know, that the end open source gives you a more trustworthy um, uh, model for software. There another aspect is you know one of our goals at the end here and and that goes into like a different aspect of fairness, right? Like you can say like the decision needs to be fair and explainable and transparent, and uh, you know and and it needs to be um, it needs to be explainable enough to deal with our psychological difference, right? That we make between a machine. Right. taking a decision, a human taking a decision. Um, but there's also an aspect of like who has access to the technology. Right? And only if it's open source, there, you know, if it's, it's, as long as it's pro proprietary, you can't guarantee that people have equal access. You know, it goes into the whole you know, arms race around AI that, you know, like 
you cannot prevent AI, right? Like if, if anyone thinks we can like just not do it, that that's ridiculous, right? It's it's it actually that would be unethical in itself because we can prove that AI saves lives, right? Um, in you know, we had at Reddit Summit, we had um, a, a customer case of like detecting sepsis uh, through AI, and they could prove that they saved lives with that. And there are plenty examples like that, right? So we have to do it, like the the benefit of AI is so clear. So this is not about like limiting AI, it's about making sure that AI is beneficial. And the only way you can do that is if you create transparency and equal access for everyone, you avoid an arms race. And all of that, like the only way to really do that is with open source from my point of view. Okay, so Frederick, how do you feel like open source addresses the idea of uh, bias and algorithms? All right, so when you start taking a look at bias, so there's there's a couple areas where, or more than a few areas where bias can uh, can come in. So um, on one side, when you start looking at bias uh, on the open source part, so uh, you start looking at what techniques are are used to train things, and so we want to make sure that these particular techniques are well understood, well known, well researched, and so the more eyeballs you can get on these techniques, the uh, the better that you are. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that open source alone can solve many of the bias problems. So, for example, when you're working in the medical space, you have HIPAA data that you may want to train certain models on that are used to save lives, it was, as was described. If that data is, uh, isn't, if we don't account for bias within those data sets, then we may end up with scenarios where uh, people from, uh, from uh, uh, minorities or people in poverty may end up with uh, worse outcomes than uh, than people who have currently have significant resources, and so so we need to make sure that we that we address it from multiple from multiple angles. Um, but uh, being having an open source model or having an open source thing that you that you work with. Uh, it helps along a variety of areas, uh, and also even in just in, in learning how to do some of this stuff. Like if you see this is how we this is how we fix the bias issue, and here's an open source example of how we of how we solved bias. That alone means that uh, even if you have someone do it in closed source, they've learned from the open source, or maybe have used an open source tool in order to make that happen. And so, like I, I do think that open source plays a very important role in in reducing bias, but certainly is not the only thing we need to do. Okay, so what do we need to do beyond that, Alex, um, including data privacy around, you know, not all, controlling the bias and how we teach those models and make sure that model is fair, but then the data we use to then train those and undo the bias, how do we protect users' privacy? Uh, so, well, from a privacy perspective, uh, well, you... Well, it, I'm from the UK, and, and in, in Europe we have this uh, thing called the GDPR, which uh, puts lots of annoying pop-ups on people's websites. And uh, you know, ultimately, what it's, it, it's it's trying to do is to request for specific opt-in for using your data. You know, I think the, um, the the over the last you know couple of decades or so, uh, it's kind of been generally accepted that you know you can uh, opt-in. Uh, just by visiting a website or using a service uh, without reading the long, you know, terms and conditions, right. and you know the amount of places and you know organizations that, that have access to your data are now using it, you know, obviously is uh, is, is is pretty pretty scary. So, uh, you know, I think there's a, a change in in culture and and understanding among consumers, and and people are you know now uh, wanting to take more ownership of you know their data and the services that they're using. Uh, so, uh, yeah, being upfront with people about what you're using the data for, uh, what specific data, uh, and, you know, who you'd be sharing it with uh, is obviously uh, very important. Uh, so, um, companies that obviously do that uh, will, you know, ultimately be trusted, you know, to do more and more things. Uh, so, that's, that's the main thing I'd say, really. Okay, and so um, talking a little bit more about data, uh, companies like Pinscreen that can create realistic videos of someone talking and things they didn't actually say, what are we doing in open source to uh, you know, create data provenance, knowing where the data is coming from and making sure that what's being presented is actually where it came from originally? Oh yeah, so yeah. so yeah. Or no, any one of you can yeah, answer, but yeah. Uh, 
Well, that, this is a, it's actually kind of work in progress. Uh, this uh, this is a, you know big topic because you know there's like li lineage between the source data through to the, the the trained model, and then you know in production, uh, data science teams are you know often uh, working at a, a sort of a, a, a different kind of um, frequency to the uh, you know in terms of deployment to the you know core app teams. Uh, so. Um, uh, version control uh, and you know being able to track that back through uh, metadata uh, and and core data sets is is a big challenge so there's there's um, you know some work from uh, open source projects like model DB uh, which is it's been doing a, a good job uh, on this um, and you yeah, have various efforts connected to you know various uh, open source uh, ml platforms is another one that Selden's connected with called kubeflow uh, that's trying to figure this out as well at the moment so um, uh, you know, it will come down to um, uh, standards and metadata and, you know, the, the various tools that are part of that pipeline, um, you know, interoperating and uh, sort of taking on board standards uh, in order for, to streamline that kind of handover of metadata between the, the components. Okay, Daniel, do you want to add Is, to that? Uh, and I think, uh, so you gave the example of, like, you know, pretty deep fake videos, right, like where... Um, we learned that like video evidence is actually not reliable anymore right. okay, because it can be faked very you know progressively uh, uh, convincing and um you know, part of the problem there is the any solution to that um has in itself privacy implications right like when you start like source signing every all data that you generate like you know your video camera basically signs the, all the videos so uh, you know it, that in itself becomes a problem because you just um eliminated the ability to have anonymous videos and things like that like right. so th 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 i think th there are a bunch of areas where we have to find broader answers in society and maybe start thinking about um, reducing the stakes a little bit, right? Because uh, you know some of these things are problem. Like why why is privacy increasingly like we had at a phase where no one cared anymore and everyone published everything, like everything everywhere, right? And and we, we, we turned into a culture of ex exhibit. Exhibitionists, I can't say that in English. Yeah. Uh, exhibitionists, yeah. right? And then, and now, like suddenly, we realize that the stakes actually are high, and and you know, we are trying to go back, and maybe we cannot go back, right? Because you know, so they, like it, it, there, are, there are some deeper questions that are not technology questions that we we have to answer because. You know, technology will force us, right? It has forced us here with the technology we already have today, and we can predict where this is going to go, um, that it's going to increase, and we, we'll have to get around to that. You can go into things like citizen scores and stuff like that, um, or, you know, we've... In the U.S., we have a new proposal for like a driver database that's collecting all kinds of information, which basically turns into a, a full-on surveillance. Um, you know, maybe you know there's a discussion that we have to have there about like how big, how high do we want the stakes to be for this? Um, you yeah, know, because otherwise, like I, I don't think you can, I don't think you can solve all of this in technology without side effects. Right, and that's why we need data and ethics. So if you, if you had to give, and this question goes to each one of you to answer, if you had to give one piece of advice to a project or a company that's starting you know, to look at AI and machine learning, what would that advice be? Oh man, that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think in terms of, uh, in, and I'll scope this around AI and ethics as opposed to just like, hey, how do you do AI? Right. So, um, I think part of it is um, take a look at what it is the the thing that you want to to build your AI on. Take a look at the impact of what is of what it's going to to have on. Like do do a, there's there's models that you can do now where uh, that don't require AI to develop these models. Like what is the what is the risk of like okay I build this particular system. What if it goes wrong? What if something breaks? What if uh, you know what 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 are what are the actual risks that we're, that we're taking on with this. And uh, use that to help, like, develop it like a threat model. See about developing it in such a way that 
you can try to work out, okay, what are, if I put an AI here, what are, what are the risks? And then from there, uh, don't skimp on, on the time necessary in order to try to, well, number one, you, should, it, should it be something you even build in the first place? Uh, but assuming you decide, yes, it's, it's worth it and, and we're going to build it, then don't skimp on, on uh, working on the efficacy and trying to work out, is this thing actually doing what I think it is? And go towards the explainability and, and fairness and so on, especially if it's on a much more important area. You know, and it's it's really a, a mindset in, in this scenario. It's like not just throwing something out there because you saw it work. Like I'll give you a quick example. When I was very first starting, when I was first starting to learn AI, like uh, it was a couple of weeks in, I was super excited. My model hit like 87.5% accuracy. And then I looked at the data and that was 87.5% of the answers were no. And so my model was saying no to everything because it thought, okay, this is great, it's, <laughs> it's working. And I was like super excited. And uh, then I, I realized I had to spend more time to work out, okay, well, what what do I need to do in order to make this model right? I know that's an extreme example, but <coughs> these type of things are, are going to come up. We're going to our models are going to make mistakes, and us as humans, we're going to make mistakes. And so, like, try to build these types of, of thread models in, and spend and spend the time to bring in experts to to help you answer these questions. Okay, Alex, you want to go and take that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, I think the the kind of um, uh, principle of kind of move fast and break things doesn't really work so well when you you know have a, a kind of uh, ethical um, consequence uh, of, of, of getting it wrong um, and uh, uh, it's ethics is something which is uh, it's not just one person's problem you know you don't just it's not just the data scientist or the, you know the, the, the data people or, or anything else it's it's a it's a full company issue and and whilst it is important to have someone in charge of it, um, it's it's really a group effort, and there's not one single thing that you need to be looking for. So, you know, there are some uh, sort of guidelines um, sort of uh, emerging. Uh, one of which actually was put together by a member of, of my team at Selden uh, called Alejandro Salcido, who's a founder of the Institute for Ethical AI and, Machi and Machine Learning. Uh, so, if you go to ethical.institute, uh, it's a non-profit org that he set up, which um, outlines uh, the areas that you should be looking at, you know, which might be helpful to kind of give you a prompt of where you should be investigating. Uh, so, you know, there are um, uh, kind of uh, packs, information packs and checklists, I suppose, for people who are in boards and, and running projects, uh, which can help prevent them from, from getting something wrong you know, by accident as well, because that's one of the biggest problems here is it's a, it's a complex space and it's very easy to get something wrong if, if you're not looking in the right areas. Okay, great advice. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll pile on to that. Right? It's, uh, you know, understand the problem space and, and you know, is this specific, right? Like uh, the mentality, you know, in, in data science, you're often happy when you get 99% right, right? That's awesome. <laughs> it's a great model. But then, you know, if you if you apply that to IT security, like, you know, the intrusion just needs to happen once, right? right. And then you're screwed. Um, so, like, so there is a difference, right? What we're doing today, most of the case, are these areas where, like, you know, 90, 99% is great, right? Um, if you go outside of that space where that's good enough, you need to be really, really careful. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys for taking the time. It was all very sage advice. And uh, I'll give it back over to Diane to close us out. All right. <laughs> <laughs>